Let's revise magnetism and electromagnetism in GCSE physics. Let's start off with the poles of a magnet. So the magnetic field is strongest at the poles and this is what it actually looks like. The field lines always go from north to south. When two magnets are close to one another, they're going to exert a force. If they are like poles, they will repel. This is the example right over here in which we have two north poles that are going to repel. If we have two unlike poles, for instance, a north pole and a south pole, then they're going to attract. This magnetic force is an example of a non-contact force. Now, magnets can be two types. We can have a permanent magnet or an induced magnet. What are some of the differences between them? So a permanent magnet will produce its own magnetic field, whereas an induced magnet is just the materials that becomes a magnet when it's placed inside of that field. An example of that could be iron or something like a paper clip that will get attracted to a magnet. If we think about it, this wasn't uh, magnetic before it was placed in the field, but became a magnet once it was within the field. And induced magnetism always causes a force of attraction and this is really, really important. When removed from the magnetic field, field, the induced magnet will lose most, if not all, of its magnetism really, really quickly. Here are a few more things that we need to remember. The region around the magnet where a force acts on another magnet is called the magnetic field, and this is our definition. The strength depends on the distance from the magnet. I mean, if we think about it, if we have a magnet over here, if we're right next to it, the force will be quite strong, but if we're really far away, then it will not be as strong. The direction at any point is given by the direction of the force that would act on another North Pole placed at that point. What does that mean? So let's have a look at an example across here. So imagine that I place a little, let's say, North Pole across here. This North Pole will be repelled by this North Pole and attracted towards the South Pole. So in a way, the magnetic field will be towards there. If I was to place a little North Pole, let's say, across here, it will actually just follow this field line, we experience a force along the direction of this field line. In practice, this means that magnetic field lines always go from north to south. Okay, we can take both of those off. Next point across here, a magnet compass contains a small bar magnet and the Earth has a magnetic field. This is actually how a compass works. So this is the Earth's magnetic field. Interestingly, the South and North Pole on the Earth are actually reversed. So the North Pole is um, on the geographic South Pole. This is not actually on the specification, but it's an interesting fact. But what we're doing when we're using a compass is we are aligning the compass needle to the magnetic field of the Earth. The Earth is very similar to a gigantic bar magnet and you can see that magnetic field in my drawing over here. There is a required practical that uh, we often need to know and that is how to plot the magnetic field pattern of a, of a magnet using a compass. So what we need to do is just place a permanent magnet on a piece of paper. Here's our magnet and we just put it on a piece of paper. Then we use a plotting compass and we will place it near the pole. We draw a dot at the point where the north needle points at. So at the moment this red arrow is pointing towards over here and we place that point. Then what we do is we move the compass to this point, we are aligning that dot with the south line, with the back of the needle. Then we repeat drawing dots until we reach the end of the magnet. And our last step will just be to join all of those dots to form a complete field line. Now let's talk about the motor effect. So if we have a current carrying wire, then we're going to have a magnetic field that is produced around it. So in the case of this wire across here, the field 
lines or just circles around it. The strength of the magnetic field depends on the current, so this kind of makes sense. If the current is higher, then the magnetic field will also be higher and the distance as well. So for instance, if we were right here, the current will be quite strong, but if we were like way over here, the current will not be as strong. Now if we were to reshape this wire and we were to, to turn it into a coil. Now essentially we just make a load of loops with this wire. This can also be known as, as a solenoid like so, but this will increase the strength of the magnetic field if we were to just loop this wire around. The magnetic field inside a solenoid is both strong and uniform. So if we're asked to describe it for two marks, the answer that the field is both strong and uniform will always give us full marks. Now it has a similar shape to the field around a bar magnet that we saw in our previous chapter. Adding an iron core will also increase the strength of the magnetic field of the solenoid and typically you will see them in the lab with iron cores. So what is actually the motor effect? When a current carrying conductor is placed in a magnetic field, the magnet producing the field and the conductor exert a force on one another. What does that mean actually? So if I have a wire and I place that in magnetic field, so this whole sort of green region here is actually a magnetic field. As long as there's current running through the wire, this wire will experience a force. It will actually move. In other words, there will be a force acting onto it. Well, the magnitude of that force is given by the following equation, the famous Bill equation, given that force is equal to magnetic flux density times current times length. In terms of symbols, the way we would write this equation is F is equal to B I L or Bill. Let's write it a little bit closer together. So F will be equal to Bill. F, of course, is the force, and this is measured in newtons n. Magnetic flux density is kind of the equivalent of magnetic field strength, and um, this is just given the symbol B. This is measured in Tesla, just like the car. Um, that's the unit, so we just write the units in brackets. We also have the current I, and I is, of course, measured in amps and finally we have the length of the wire which is just L and that of course is just measured in meters. Okay well we know that this wire will experience a force. Which way is the force? In other words to answer that question we're going to need to use Fleming's left hand rule. Now it's actually a lot simpler than it looks. All we need to do is follow these very simple steps. Our first step is to make sure the fingers on our left hand and I've really made sure to emphasize this because you're going to get the wrong result if you use your right hand but make sure the fingers on your left hand are perpendicular. Okay, your first finger points in the direction of the field, your second finger points in the direction of the current, like so, and our thumb is the motion or the direction of the force. You can use this mnemonic to try and help you remember this, so your first finger starts with an F, um, is uh, the direction of the field which also starts with an F and our second finger it has a C and also current well starts with a C and sort of thumb you can use the M in thumb to um, liken it to motion. Uh, it's kind of difficult to visualize in 3D in a video however I've done my best to do this drawing we have the force here the field and the current. In practice as well I've applied this to a little problem in which the field is going down so the direction of the field is going down this is our first finger our second finger in this case is out of the board or out of the out of your screen at the moment really so I'm just gonna make a little note that this here is out of the board. My handwriting is terrible today. Okay, and our thumb is the direction of the 
motion. So in this case, we have a conductor across here, which is going to be moving from left to right. Um, you can have a go at practicing this question across here. So what direction will this wire move in? Well, first of all, um, we have a current which is going from the larger terminal, which is the positive terminal, to the negative terminal. So a current is going this way, um, which is left to right and let's say that we have a magnetic field which is let's say into the board so into the board uh, you can have a go at practice this in front of the screen right now and you can pause the video and let me know which way will the wire move okay well the answer is that the wire will be moving upwards we could apply Fleming's left-hand rule directly to an electric motor. What do I mean by this? Well, we can explain its motion. Imagine that I just have a loop of wire. So this is just a wire. We could connect it to something like a cell, for instance. And let's say we have some current which is going this way and then that way. If we place that in between two magnets, we're going to have a magnetic field and the field lines will be going from north to south along here. So these here are the field lines. If we apply Fleming's left hand rule, we're going to see that there's going to be a perpendicular force on this loop and a perpendicular force in the opposite direction on the opposite loop, which means that the magnet will start spinning the loop. So the loop will spin. Now, if we think about it, this is a direct conversion of electromagnetic energy to kinetic energy. And in other words, this is an electric motor. Loudspeakers and headphones also use the motor effect. Uh, however, they just use that effect to convert the variations in the current to pressure variations in sound waves by just essentially moving a little loop of wire with the correct frequency which makes a sound of the correct frequency and you can hear things such as this video right now which is actually using the motor effect and you can hear me because the loudspeaker on your computer or your phone is converting current to sound waves. And now let's talk about induced potentials, transformers, and later on the national grid. So first of all, what is an induced potential? If an electrical conductor moves relative to a magnetic field, or there is a change in the magnetic field around the conductor, a potential difference is induced across the conductor. What do I mean by that? So let me just put that and explain that into simple terms. Here's a magnet. So this here is the North Pole, we can't quite see it. And if all I do is just move this magnet backwards and forwards, then there's going to be an induced electromagnetic field, an induced current within this copper circular wire. And this is one of the most amazing things discovered by Michael Faraday and explained by Michael Faraday that if we were to move a magnet, we can actually create an electrical current. And this is the generator effect. If the conductor is part of a complete circuit, then we have, well, the current which is flowing through it and uh, we have a generator. Interestingly, the current going through this wire will then induce its own magnetic field and the secondary magnetic field always opposes the first field and that is to, to because of energy conservation because otherwise you would just get energy out of nowhere. Interestingly, the generator effect is used in a device called an alternator to generate AC and in a dynamo to generate DC and we need to know this for the exam. For the higher tier, we also need to know that microphones use the generator effect to convert pressure variations in sounds 
into essentially electrical signals, variations in current. What do I mean by that? So if I have something like a microphone, you can speak into the microphone. There's gonna be a magnet inside of the microphone that's gonna move a tiny bit, and that's gonna generate a small current, which can then be converted to a digital signal. We also need to know about transformers. Now, transformers can alter potential difference or voltage and they consist of a primary coil and a secondary coil. We also use a soft iron core to essentially increase the magnetic properties of the material. We need to use AC current for a transformer. So the input voltage can then be altered depending on the number of loops. The formula which governs this is that the primary voltage over the secondary voltage, V subscript P, in this case stands for primary voltage, and V subscript S for secondary voltage, is equal to the ratio of the number of turns in the primary coil divided by the number of turns in the secondary coil. And if the secondary voltage is higher than the primary voltage, we have a step-up transformer. So we could have started with, I don't know, 10 volts and ended up with 20. If it's a step-down transformer, then Vs is smaller than Vp. Now let's just do a little bit of rearranging practice for this equation because it comes up quite often in exams. Let's say that we want to rearrange for something like, I don't know, Vs, the secondary voltage. One of the easiest ways to rearrange this equation is to just use cross multiplication. So this times that, so that will be Vp times Ns will be equal to this times that which is equal to NP times VS. And finally, I'm just going to divide both sides by NP, and I'm gonna find that my secondary voltage will be equal to VP times NS divided by NP. Let's also rearrange for the primary voltage for a little bit of practice. After all, we are revising. So VP will be equal to NS, oops, and P divided by N S multiplied by V S. And because we're revising, let's also rearrange for N P. So N P will then be equal to V P over V S times N S. And our final rearrangement, let's do one more. That will be for N S. So I'm going to use cross multiplication once again. So this times that. So let's write this over here. So V P N S will be equal to this times that, which is N P times V S. And if we want to rearrange for NS, this will be equal to NP times VS divided by VP. In transformers, what we're actually conserving is electrical power. And if the secondary power is equal to the primary power, in this case P stands for power, then we have a transformer which is 100% efficient. So I can just add here this is 100% efficient. Because power is equal to Vi, the equation that this turns into, the secondary power is just equal to the secondary voltage times the secondary current, and then the primary um, power is equal to the primary voltage times the primary current, and we can be asked to solve some problems with that. Okay guys, hopefully this video was really useful. What you need to do next is carry on revising and have a look at this waves topic, which is super interesting and super important, comes up in exams every single year. If you wanna get maximum grades, have a look at this video right over here. Thank you very much for watching.